Augustine once said, the New Testament is in the old concealed. The Old Testament is in the new revealed. That is another way of expressing the reality of God's progressive revelation. But it also stresses the importance of knowing the Old Testament. The Old Testament provides the background and the foundation for New Testament revelation. We know that Jesus Christ is the pinnacle of the revelation of God to man. But he did not come unannounced. His coming was declared in advance in the Old Testament. And in fact, there are truths that we cannot know about him apart from the Old Testament revelation. And what we must understand is that the Bible, both the Old Testament and New Testaments, comprise a unified revelation of God and its thematic unity is found in Jesus Christ. This is one of the main reasons why I am so excited about our study of Zechariah this summer. This book includes more promises of the Messiah than any other book except Isaiah. In fact, when we get to the book of Zechariah, Christ is barely even concealed, but is often blatantly revealed to the eyes of the, those who are trained by the later revelation of the New Testament. So frequent and dramatic are the references to Christ in Zechariah that this book has often been called the gospel according to Zechariah. This book is a treasure trove of Christology. It deals much with the first advent of Christ, but even more with the second advent of Christ. In fact, this book divides naturally into two main sections, and that is how I want us to approach our study during these summer months. In the first eight chapters, you have what one commentator has called an analysis of the present while the last six chapters deal with an announcement of the future. These chapters are generally understood by Bible scholars to have come at a later time in Zechariah's ministry during the reign of Xerxes, who made Esther the queen of Persia. And because of the length of this book, <clears throat> will not allow us to go through it completely verse by verse, I want us to spend the first half of the summer looking at the present condition of Israel, and the second half we'll look at those future events. And we're going to get some samples of the material in this incredible book, but I believe that this will be a rich and exciting study nonetheless. Though we are separated by time and circumstances from the prophet Zechariah by hundreds of years, the issues of faith and godliness have not changed, and therefore, this is still a very relevant book in our day and time. As we go through this book, we'll find many contemporary applications for our lives. And I want us to try to get to the first six verses of chapter 1 this morning, but before we go there, we need to get a grasp of the historical setting of this book. In fact, verse 1 gives us that setting. Look with me at verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. Notice the three names other than the Lord and Zechariah that are given to us in this verse. Darius was the king of Persia. Bechariah was Zechariah's father and Iddo his grandfather. But because Nehemiah 12 lists Zechariah as the, he the head of the house of Iddo, many Bible scholars have speculated that Berechiah may have died at a young age 
and Zechariah was raised by his grandfather. But like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Zechariah was a priest. And according to the historical record of the reign of King Darius, this would have been around the year 520 B.C. In fact, verse 1 gives us a very specific date, which is one of three given in the first half of this book. The setting is in the days of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple following the years of the Babylonian captivity. The name Zechariah means God remembers. And its significance is to emphasize the fact that God always remembers his covenants. And even though he has punished his people by judging them through the Babylonian captivity, he is now bringing them back and reestablishing them in their own land. The Persians had defeated the Babylonians, and in 538 B.C., God moved on the heart of King Darius to free the Jews from their captivity and even to encourage them to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city and the temple. He even sent with them all the articles of gold that had been taken from the temple that were used in the temple service. And by the way, Ezra and Nehemiah are other Old Testament books that help us to understand this period in the history of Israel. Haggai is another because he was a contemporary prophet with Zechariah. After the Jews were released from their captivity, things went very well at first. Filled with gratitude to God for their release, they wasted little time in going to work on the walls of the city and the beginning stages of rebuilding the temple. But it wasn't long before they faced opposition and they got discouraged and put a stop to the work. In fact, when Zechariah wrote his prophecy, the construction had been on hold for 16 years. And that's why God sent Zechariah and Haggai to address the situation. At this point, great discouragement would have been prevalent among the Jews there in Jerusalem. The walls of the city still were in ruins. The walls, of course, were very vital for the protection of the people. And at the center of the city, there was the conspicuous absence of the temple. And you can just hear the prophet Haggai bellowing out, why are you sitting in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord is still lying desolate? And he admonished the people to go up to the mountains and bring wood and rebuild the temple that the Lord God may be pleased with it and be glorified. And so he admonished them. And they had laid the foundation of the temple in 536 BC, but that was as far as they had gotten. So Haggai was used of God along with Zechariah to get them back on track. And in fact, once they got back after it, it only took them four years to complete it. And by the way, that is an important word about the enormous negative impact of discouragement and the incredible positive impact of obedience and hard work. You see, once their hearts changed toward the work, they were able to accomplish an amazing amount in just a short period of time. But getting back to this book, if you compare the tone of Haggai to the tone of Zechariah, you will find quite a difference. Whereas Haggai's message has a tone of rebuke, Zechariah's is one of hope and optimism. Zechariah is without doubt the more positive of the two. 
And with its emphasis on the coming Messiah, his theme really was to encourage the people to build the temple so that the Lord's Messiah could come and occupy it. In other words, they were not just building for their own day and time, but also for the future with the hope of the coming Messiah in mind. And when we get to the apocalyptic section, future section of the book, we will see this moving into the time period that is even still future for us in our day. The time of the millennial kingdom of Christ. But this is one of those books where we see something that is very common in the Old Testament, which is a picture of the mountain peaks of prophecy as if the first and second advents of the Messiah are back to back. Although we know that those are separated by more than 2,000 years of church history. But Zechariah urged the people to keep their eye not only on their present responsibilities, but also on their future glory. And by getting back to work on the temple, they could become actively involved in preparing for God's future redemption. Zechariah understood the power of motivating the people of God in the present by casting a vision for the glory of the future. And he assured them that the future was bright and that God had not forgotten them, that he had promised to send his Messiah and that they could count on that taking place. In fact, they could count on the promise of God that he would establish an eternal kingdom and they were part of that. And that is the very same thing that should motivate us today. We are part of that eternal kingdom. And God is still in control of history. And we will be in that kingdom forever. And so that motivates us just as it motivated them in that day and time. Now, one last point of background has to do with how Zechariah's life ended Now, his message is not really related to this, but according to Matthew 23, verse 35, he was eventually murdered between the temple and the altar. Ironically, his life ended at the hands of the people in the very temple that God had used him to see to completion. In fact, according to that passage, Zechariah was the last of the Old Testament prophets before John the Baptist. And what this means as we read this book is that prophecy is soon to be silent for more than 400 years. And it is the hope that Zechariah gave that carried the people of God through those silent years up to the first advent of the Lord's Messiah. But with that background in mind, let's move into the first part of Zechariah's message. It is a clear call to repentance. And we see it in three aspects. We see the reason for repentance, the repetition of rebuke, and the right response. So let's begin with the reason for repentance. Look with me at verses one through three again. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Clearly, God is calling for his people through his prophet to repent and to return to him. But why is that needed? Because they had been rebellious and had refused to obey him. After their release from captivity, they had done well for a while. 
They came out of that 70 year period of judgment with a burning desire to serve God faithfully and to learn the lesson from the Babylonian captivity that they would never engage in idolatry again. And they came out of Babylon really with great joy and they immediately went to work on the walls of the city and on the temple. In fact, they made very good progress in those early days. But with the passing of time, their zeal for the Lord began to wane. They faced some opposition from some of the people of the land, and the work was really, really hard. So for 16 years, the work on the temple was neglected, which is a way of saying that God himself was neglected. But notice some of the details here in these first three verses. Verse two says, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Now, when you see the word Lord in all caps in the New American Standard, it is referring to the proper name for God in the Bible, which is the word Yahweh. And here, Zechariah declares, he was very angry with their fathers. Now, this is the language of intense indignation. In fact, in the original Hebrew, this is a doubling of the word anger here. The text literally says, the Lord was angry with anger. Now, in the English we would consider it redundant to use a word twice, but in the Hebrew, that was done to amplify the force of the expression. Most English translations seek to communicate this doubling effect with the rendering very angry. He was very angry. But this concept of God being angry is something that is somewhat problematic problematic in our day and time. People don't like to hear that. One pastor tells about driving down a highway in Florida and seeing a billboard that said simply, God is not angry. There was no other message on the sign, no phone number, no name of an organization that had sponsored the advertisement, just the words, God is not angry. Of course, someone had invested a great deal of money to have that sign placed there. And that message must have been very important to someone. He or she wanted the world to know, or at least all who drove down that highway, that there is no reason to fear the anger of the Lord. And the truth of the matter is that to many people in our day and time, Anger seems to be incompatible to the nature of God. A lot of people want to see God as all love, but never anger, never wrath. The problem with that view, of course, is that it is unbiblical. The Bible is very clear that the anger and wrath of God is as much a part of his nature as his love. And here is a place in Scripture where that is clearly and absolutely declared. God was extremely angry with their fathers. Now, of course, we need to understand that God's anger is different from our anger. You know, God does not lose his temper and pitch a fit like we often do. He's not some sort of ogre in the sky, eagerly waiting to lash out at people in some vindictive fashion, because if he did that, and that was the case, none of us would survive. We would all be toast by now. No, the Bible tells us that God is slow to anger, and that his anger is always righteous anger. It is designed to purify his people. The Bible says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. 
and he scourges every son whom he receives. That's Hebrews 12, 6. We must not reject the clear biblical teaching in regard to the anger and wrath of the Lord and his discipline. In fact, the Bible declares that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And both the Old Testament and the New Testament speak of God's wrath alongside his love. The Bible is clear in our text this morning that rebellion and disobedience brings the Lord's anger. When people deliberately take the path of sin and rebellion, when we dis regard his commands. And when we go our own way against his will, we can expect his righteous wrath, just as the Jewish people in Zechariah's day experienced. And of course, this is speaking of their fathers here, the ones who had gotten so caught up in idolatry that they had been carried away as captives into Babylon for 70 years. But what Zechariah is implying here is don't fall into the same trap they did. Don't return to the same kind of sin and rebellion and experience the same kind of wrath. And my friend, listen, this applies to us. Anytime you and I rebel against God and go our own way and follow our own path of sin and compromise, We place ourselves in God's anger zone. One commentator writes, Several years ago, our family spent a day at SeaWorld in Orlando and visited Shamu Stadium. As we came into the arena, we noticed that close to the tank, where the huge black and white killer whales perform, the seats and concrete risers around them are all painted blue. These rows are known as the soak zone. He said, before the show began, an announcement came over the PA system warning that everyone in the soak zone would definitely get wet, even drenched. Sure enough, when Shamu and the other killer whales circled into the tank and started jumping and splashing around, The soak zone lived up to its name. Most of the people in those seats took an impromptu bath. And then he gave this observation. Now, Shamu did not soak those people because he picked them arbitrarily for splashing. They got drenched only because of where they were sitting, a place that had been duly marked and about which they had been warned. So it is with God. In the very same way, those who rebel against God and follow a path of sin and idolatry put themselves in God's anger zone. They set themselves up for the wrath and the chastisement of God. This is what had happened to their forefathers, the the previous generation before the time of Zechariah, years of idolatry, syncretism, hypocritical worship, moral failure, exploitation of the poor, unapproved alliances with other nations, and corrupt leadership had stretched the Lord's patience to its breaking point. Ultimately, they were carried away into Babylon as a punishment. And Zechariah is urging his own generation to learn from this. He's warning them not to fall into the same kind of judgment. He's calling for them to do something their fathers did not do, and that is to repent. But notice something else in this passage. Notice the use of the name, the Lord of hosts. Three times we see that name for God used here. Verse three says, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts that I may return to you, says 
the Lord of hosts. That is a way of expressing the nature of Yahweh as king over his people and as commander of all the heavenly hosts. It is a name that emphasizes the sovereignty of God. This is intended both as a warning and as an encouragement. As a warning, it is a reminder that the one calling them to repent is the one who has all power and authority. And as an encouragement, it is a reminder that he is sovereign Lord of all, therefore they have nothing or no one to fear. If the Lord is on their side, who can be against them? And remember, they're in a period of great discouragement. So Zechariah is admonishing them with great words of encouragement to go on and to do all that the Lord has called them to do. And this is an important word for anyone who might be asking the question, how can I start all over again? All who have experienced a broken marriage or a broken friendship or a shattered dream need to hear this word. It was critical at this stage in the history of Israel, but it is often just as important in our lives as well. How do we get right with God, and what will it mean for us if we do? The driving message of the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments is that we can always repent and return to the Lord, and when we do, He will greatly bless our lives. Now, we could spend a whole lot of time on the subject of repentance this morning, but this is Zechariah's primary message. Repentance involves both a turning from sin and a turning to God. In verse 4, Zechariah admonishes, "'Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds.'" Repentance involves a turning away from sin, both from the way of sin and the works of sin. In other words, repentance is about both our actions and our attitudes. And sometimes we think we have repented when we have curbed our behavior a little bit, but that is not true repentance. Genuine repentance always includes our hearts and our desires. True repentance always includes a broken heart over how our sin has affected our relationship with God and with others. And notice here that repentance is primarily a relational act. The Lord says in verse 3, return to me. This is not about fixing deviant behaviors. It is about restoring full fellowship with God. For those in Zechariah's day, it was more than just you need to get back to work on the temple. It was you need to return to the Lord with all your hearts. Repentance is as much about relationship as anything else. And the word of God comes with the promise that if we will return to him, he will return to us. Look at verse 3 again. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. If God seems far away, guess who moved? God is more than ready to return to us in full fellowship if we will repent of our sin and rebellion against him. And God's grace and forgiveness are always at the ready when we repent. This is the great incentive for repentance. This is the gospel according to Zechariah. The good news of great joy that our Lord is ready to return to anyone who will turn to him in repentance and faith. Well, we could camp here a a long time, but we've got to move on. 
Not only do we see the need for repentance, but we also see the repetition of rebuke. Go back to verse 4. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. The prophets in the Old Testament gave repeated warnings concerning sin and rebellion against God, but unfortunately, the previous generation did not listen. That's why they were carried away into captivity. So those who had returned from Babylon needed a history lesson. It has often been pointed out that those who refuse to learn from history are destined to repeat it. That is Zechariah's message here. He is urging them to consider their fathers and to learn from them. In verse 5, he says, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? He's saying that both their wicked fathers and the righteous prophets are gone. The swift tide of death has carried them away. But the great lesson taught by their fathers was still present for all of them to see. And what is that lesson? That the word of God always comes to pass. The principles of God and his word are unchanging and unfailing. There is always a great price to pay for sin and rebellion. Their fathers had been warned by the prophets to repent, but they refused. Therefore, they paid the price for their sin. But the point Zechariah is making is that the present generation doesn't have to follow in their steps. They can learn from that lesson and repent of their sin, and they can be fully restored to God. Notice what he says in verse 6. But did not my words and my statutes, which, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Now, the word overtake there is a word that means to catch up with. It is the same word that is used in Deuteronomy when Moses promised the children of Israel that his blessings would overtake them if they obeyed God but his curses would overtake them if they disobeyed. In fact, Deuteronomy 28, 2 says, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you will obey the Lord your God. But verse 15 says, But it shall come about if you will not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Listen, that is an unchanging principle of God's word. When we heed the will of God, we will have his blessing. When we rebel against it, we will face his chastisement. And it is a very dangerous thing for us when we ignore the warnings that are given to us in his word. Whether those are given to us by preachers and teachers of our generation or through other godly people in our lives. Pastor Bobby Welch tells the story of something that occurred on the longest bridge in the world over water. The 24-mile Lake Pontchartrain Causeway in New Orleans. And apparently, true story, a barge was going through and took out part of the causeway, and there were several vehicles that fell off the causeway into the water, but one man was able to stop in time, and he got out of his car, and he got on the highway, on the road, on the bridge, and trying to wave people down and trying to get people to stop. And one guy, it totally ignored the warning, and continued on to his death. But finally, they were able to get some cars to stop, and then 
they were able to prevent anyone else from perishing. Folks, listen. When a preacher preaches a message about the judgment of God, that is never a popular message. And yet, it is an urgent message. It is one we need to hear. And ultimately, it is a loving message because it warns of great danger ahead. This is why we must proclaim the message of repentance and we must heed it ourselves. And if there is someone in your life that is appealing to you to repent of some kind of sin, that is someone who really loves you. As one author wrote, people who sound the warnings in our lives may seem to be a thorn in our side and their message may seem seem negative or tiresome as they keep telling lost people to turn to Christ for salvation or urging wayward believers to return to the Lord. But the time will come when God's judgment will overtake those who reject God's warnings. The broken down walls of Jerusalem and the absence of the temple were mute reminders to the rebellion of their fathers, but they did not have to go the same way. And that leads us to the last thing we see here, which is the right response. Look at the last part of verse six. Then they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts proposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Now, scholars have debated whether this refers to Zechariah's generation or the previous one, but I think we have to say it is referring to those who are hearing Zechariah's message. And there are two primary reasons why we should interpret it that way. First, the previous generation did not repent, and that is why they had to be carried away into captivity. Second, we know that this generation did, in fact, repent, and they went back to work on the temple, and they completed it in four years. So Zechariah's message to his own generation began with the foundation of repentance. Everything else that he has to say to them is built on that foundation. He drills down to their greatest need, Not that of just getting back to work on the temple, but to have a renewed heart of devotion to the Lord. And this is the foundation for every generation of God's people, including ours. The foundation for God's kingdom work must begin with a repentant heart. And nowhere is that seen more clearly than in the ministry of Jesus Christ, who came proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And for 2,000 years of church history, those who have been willing to repent and believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord have experienced what Zechariah was talking about. But to an even greater degree, because we now live in the new covenant, age. If you have never repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you, the good news is that you can have salvation and eternal life in him. And even greater than the temporal blessings of God in your life, you can have the assurance of living forever with God in heaven. But the message of repentance is not just for unbelievers. It is for believers as well. And if you're a Christian this morning, but maybe you have backslidden into sin and spiritual decline, remember the history lesson Zechariah placed before his own generation. How easy it is for us to become so wrapped up in our own concerns that we become indifferent to the things of God. So the Lord is pleading with us this morning to lay aside all lesser things 
and to give, give ourselves wholeheartedly to the things of God. Oh, we may not be called upon to rebuild a physical temple in Jerusalem, but we are called upon to be about building his kingdom through the work of his church. I'll close with this. Have you ever had your GPS tell you to do a U-turn? You know, you're going the wrong way and your GPS says, when possible, do a U-turn. That's the teaching of repentance. That's the call of the word of God. Anytime we see that the path we are going down is the wrong path, we need to do a U-turn and turn around and go the other way. What about you? Have you experienced that reality? Have you repented of your sin and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? As a believer, is there an area of compromise in your life? Have you become indifferent to the things of God? Are you not as active or as involved as you once were? The message of Zechariah is a message we desperately need to hear. Return to the Lord and he will return to us. Perhaps that's what we need to do this morning. You need to repent, turn, and be restored to full fellowship with God. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to heed this message, that we would have your wisdom, that we would not take this lightly, that we would look at our own lives and see if there's any area of compromise, any area of sin or rebellion. And if so, that we would be willing that we would have broken hearts and repentant hearts today, that we would desire to have full fellowship with God. If there are those today that have never repented of sin and turned to Jesus Christ alone for salvation, I pray that they would do that this morning and start that, that life of living under the Lordship of Christ. Lord, I pray that all of us would respond, that we would have re repentant hearts. In fact, for believers, that that would just be a, an ongoing thing. Anytime we see sin, we immediately turn from it. And Lord, I pray that you would make us people after your own heart. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, teach us this lesson, help us to follow it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this